And here we are again, folks. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. So proud to be with you today. Uh, do you know diversity? We need to have diversity in our life. If we're going to have a, a productive life, we need a diversity in it. Some of the diversity is <laughs> not pleasant, but it's important. Uh, we just uh, did a great spiritual uh, connotation and an outline on the book of Hebrews of Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the God of Gods, and who he was. But now, as we were learning about Jesus and we were in school, we did a thing called homiletics. And there is a nature, everything that happens on the earth and everything we do has a nature to it. There is a nature to this word homiletics. Let's see what that is. Homiletics is a science. Everything really is a science. The light that I'm standing here in is a science. Matter of fact, just yesterday, I was reading some very astounding things about the man who uh, made the incandescent light and made many things in this world that work. And he... Uh, tried and failed and he tried thousands of times he tried and failed but he said this can be done and he maintained the idea that it could be done and it was done it's like the guy that lost everything in a fire and he goes down there where the fire was and his building's gone and everything's gone and he he goes on and gets a brand new table and he sets the table right there in front of the building, just inside of the building, because it's his building still. And he puts a, a sign on there. Uh, the new home of whatever it was that burnt. And this is the new home. It's fixing to be remodeled. It's fixing to go back together. It's going to be better than the other home was in the same hole, in the same place. And this is what we need to do. Homiletics, for me, was starting over again in an education of Bible. Bible, it was systematically setting forth a study in the Bible. I systematically set forth a study in the Bible. And, and the body of laws and the principles uh, which are at, uh, which are all at mostly rest. The, these laws, these Bible laws and things, and things, are they're, they're there in the Bible. They're asleep. You wake them up. You take your Bible and you open the covers and you wake them up homiletically. That means you're going to put them in order. And as you put them in order, you're going to take, and like the names of certain sciences, it's a science. Homiletics is the name of a science. And it's just like many other sciences as uh, ethics and mathematics. Those are sciences. Ethics and math mathematics. Those are scientists. Science. Uh, even though plural. Some of them are plural. Uh, they have a plural form, yet they have an active position. They're active. And so the words of the Bible are active. Uh, all the nouns, the pronouns, the singular things, and the uh, things that are more than singular. Uh, homiletics is using the terms in a proper way as has been used in the um, circles. It's bringing full circle I, a sentence. Take a sentence and bring it full circle to its fullest meaning. Sometimes you have to go to what it relates to. And the science and the, and of of our preaching, some preachers bring forth more than others. I studied every single solitary day of the week, every hour of the day. Uh, not very long ago, before I put my head down to sleep, I had my headphones in and went to sleep with a great, great, great preacher preaching and teaching. And you say, well, how many times you do that? Well, I may use that same tape. I still do tapes. I have thousands of tapes. And I, I do tape ministry in my own head on a daily basis every day. I sleep with one on. I'll put one on an hour or so long. And I'll put it on. Put it in my head while I'm sleeping. And, and I'm listening to it. 
And so I, I, I love, I love, I love preaching. I love to listen to men who are stewardess, who did their homiletics, who have got into the Word. Uh, some have felt that regarding the homiletics as a science, that the preacher will thus become encumbered with stiff formalities and inflexible rules. You've got to be careful you don't do that. You could do that. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. Do you know if you face homiletics with the heart and not with your intelligence, you will have it in a different form. It won't be in a, uh, a dramatic, just, rah, this is it, this is it, this is it. No. It'll be, this is what Jesus says. <laughs> and it's easy. And he says, uh, don't do this. Thou shalt not. Thou shall not do these things anymore. Thou shall not commit adultery. Now you're saved. Now you're following God. You shouldn't commit adultery even if you're not saved. But he said, Thou shall not commit adultery anymore. And then some instructions in the homiletics in the past have prompted such fears. A lot of people have fears when they start studying this type of way and studying the discourses uh, that are in the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, the Bible is full of discourses, and and it's not just science, and and it's not poorly presented. It's presented perfect. God presented His Bible at all times, all ages, and all seasons, and it's good for anybody, any time, anywhere, any day, any night, or no matter what. The Bible is a book that is a comforting book. It, it also can be a discomforting book. If you want to live like the devil, the book will discomfort you. If you want to live like the Lord, it will comfort you. And learning homiletics is how to put it together so that you can have a, the branch of theology that you need to follow the teaching and the principles and the rules that I put forth for to govern sermon preparation and also uh, to be find <clears throat> the reauthoric applied which is uh, complete re over and over and over and over again the reconstruction of the same thing and uh, it's a sacred discourse the Bible is a sacred book everything in it is sacred but if you want to bring it out to where the discourse you're talking about is, you must discover that particular theme that God has called you to use and get in it and use the principles of homiletics as a glance through an analysis of the best sermon in every church. I listen to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, after sermon all week. I probably listen to uh, 25, 30, even more sermons per week by different preachers. <coughs> Some preachers are apt to put out perfect, uh, perfect, I mean unreal stuff, unreal, unreal, hard to believe that they could come up with it and, and put it in the, the way they put it. I tell you what it's like, it's, eating, it's like eating, I love ice cream. I can sit down to a nice big bowl of ice cream, thoroughly enjoy it. That's just one of my enjoyments, eating an ice cream. Eating a bowl of ice cream is an enjoyment. Listening to a well-prepared sermon is like eating a bowl of ice cream to me. I enjoy it. I can listen to a one-hour sermon, uh, and, not, and it's like minutes to me. It's like ten minutes to me. It's gone. Just bam, it's gone. I stick another one right on. Maybe by a different person. Maybe by a, total, a totally different atmosphere, a totally different uh, tone of voice, a totally different way that he studied, that he came to the Lord, uh, that he follows. He may be a preacher that uh, <clears throat> is hoarse and, and preaches hard and stiff and loud, or he may be a preacher that preaches soft and easy and comfortable and just everything flows. And then there are preachers that are uh, Man, horrendously smart, horrendously smart. So smart, it's unreal. It's, 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 homiletics is a science 
which treats the nature and the classification, the analysis, the, the uh, const, uh, construction, and the uh, composition of a sermon. That's what homiletics is. Putting it all together and making all of these classifications. Nature is the classification of doing an analysis and putting together the construction of the composition of a sermon. And that's what it's about. If you want to be a, sermon, a sermonizer, you must learn how to sermon. And, and uh, <clears throat> it's the science in which preaching is the art. It is an art. Preaching is an art. It's a gift from God, a learned gift from God, that is an art. And which the, the product of it is a good sermon. And behind that, when I was studying that, I put a little thing behind it. It said, I rest my case. <laughs> I rest my case. I, I write words behind my studies. I wrote four in one again. The creation of the world. There's four in one things in, sermon, in putting a sermon together. <clears throat> you need four good points in there. Uh, the the uh, creation of the world uh, and, and then God said I rest my case I created it and I rest my case I rest it and here it is I give it to you and, and, and I put mankind on it and uh, I put the note the, the, uh, the resurrection that's divine completeness and perfection the resurrection bodily of Jesus Christ put the stamp of divine completeness on God's book and upon his people that choose to follow him. By the way, you do not choose God, he chooses you. God picks out whom he will and offers all a way to heaven, but he offers some a work on their way to heaven. And he offered me a work on my way to heaven. So I had to learn, and I am learning, and I never will always learn completely uh, uh, the nature of a sermon. What is the nature of a sermon? One of the first things is you've got to be stewardess. You've got to come on the, 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 the uh, systematic oral address. That's what a sermon is. It's a systematic oral address. Now, if you don't know what you're talking about, nobody else is going to listen to you either. Because they're not going to listen to you ramble on about things you don't know something about. And another thing is you've got to adapt into your mind is the basis of biblical truth. And you, what is that? What is the basis of biblical truth? Do you know what that is? That's living what you say, living what you preach, living what you do, living, <clears throat> preparing and presenting for the purpose of persuading. How are you going to persuade somebody of something that you do not believe or act upon yourself. You've got to believe it and act upon it yourself. So that, hey, if one thing you've got to remember, that as you go out into this world, you walk out your door, you're under obvious scrutiny, and your neighbor sees you, and they say, hey, you know that man's a preacher? I heard him cuss his dog. Do you cuss your dog? Do you preach in a pulpit? And then use... A slide remarks or bad language or do have bad uh, customs in your life. I've painted, I've been a paint contractor for years and years and years. I painted in many a preacher's house. Many a preacher's house. One particular preacher sticks in my mind. It really sticks in my mind. It really sticks in my mind. I never saw a gospel book in his house. I never saw a Bible in his house. I never saw anything that pertained to God with that man and he was a Bible preacher preached in a church. In a first church. I never saw anything or any resemblance. As a matter of fact, I never got an inkling speaking with him or talking with him that he was even a Christian. But he was a preacher. He knew some homiletics. He knew how to put a word out. But it was a dead word. You have to have Jesus Christ in your heart 
in order to preach his book. If you don't have him in your heart, you cannot preach his book. The word sermon. That's a great word, isn't it? The word sermon. What is a sermon? Uh, uh, derived from a Latin word meaning speech. It is a speech, but it's proclaimed in a different mannerism. A true speech is ordinary a development of some thought with clarity and stands out in one's memory and, and in their mind it stands out that it's a that it is a speech with a connotation to it that is spiritual and that's what we have to have if we're going to do there are other di ideas uh, around and and that uh, put it in different groups and only only one stands out though as a supreme thing and that's when you're sermoning the Word of God and formulating it with the unity that the Bible has. It's, isn't it funny that you can go in preparation to put a sermon together and you can go from one man's words in a place like in Jeremiah for instance and then you can come up to the New Testament in Matthew see the outcome of what Jeremiah was saying and come into the New Testament and fulfill the Old Testament in the New Testament. And they went from law and they went from living in the desert and everything to now we live in houses on land and, and, and we live in a uh, sumptuous way in a big sense of the word and we have the same word today that they had back in the 1800s when they rode, rode mules and did everything that they did. But a sermon is an explanation and the illustration of the progressive, direct, and personal. A sermon is like a brick. It fulfills its function only as it's placed in the relationship of the structure. Now, if you're building a brick house, you don't put a cement block in there somewhere in the middle of the house. So you drive by and you see that brick house with a cement block stuck right in the middle of it. Be careful. I'm bad about putting cement blocks in my sermons that I put together. I'll put one together and I'll grab a cement block sometime out of the air and put it in there and it doesn't belong in there. And so I try to clarify it <laughs> I put over here union and division and <clears throat> everything is supposed to be unionized in the sermon it's supposed to flow from beginning to end well I'm bad about breaking the flow sometimes it's like when we're going up the river and we're going to go fishing and we come to a, a uh, shoal in the river which is rocks sticking out of the water and the water's flowing over the shoal. It takes a an ardent and a qualified man, boat here, to go up through those shoals. I ride with two people, there's two people, my preacher and my boy are the two people I know can actually look at those shoals and go up through those shoals without tearing the motor off the back of their boat. And, and just kind of moving right on, rapid. You have to move rapid because you're in swift, swift water. And so you have to go up through there rapidly with no hesitation. Once you start, you have to go. You can't quit. You can't stop in the middle of the stream because you'll get turned around. You'll both get up against a rock and capsize it and you'll all be swimming down the, the, the river. So uh, a sermon's that way. Once you start a sermon, you need to find out where the shoals are, where the rocks are, and, and you don't need to capsize your boat in the middle of a sermon and get in a hard place. I've been there and done that. And uh, lose your train of thought. You, that can happen to you. Uh, there are six reauthoric uh, processes that combine a formulation in a sermon. And you must have those in your six reauthoric things. You must need them. And if you're going to do a one hour sermon, which will come out, you'll have an introduction with yourself, which will be four to six minutes, and then you'll do a sermon for 35 
to 40 minutes, and then you'll do your finalization and your altar call and whatever. And so you need a 35 to 40 minute steady flow of a message. And if you're going to go into shows, you need to prepare for them in the center of your, your message. If you're going to jump back somewhere in the Old Testament and put a shoal in there and say, this goes along hand and foot with this here. Well, your hands up here and your feet are down there. You walk on your feet and you work with your hands. Two different things. But if you're going to bring both of them into the same subject, you need to be moving. And when you're doing a sermon or a sermonette, it needs to be a moving sermon. It needs to move on through as quickly as you can, yet as positive as you can. Say as much positive uh, things, rhetoric things, that's uh, reiterating. All you're ever doing in a sermon is reiterating what has already been said, what has already been done. Uh, these include uh, narration, interpretation, illustration, application, uh, argumentation and also excitation and that's the main one you want to be an excitator you want to excitate the people when they leave they want to have had an excitation if you come drive to a church sit down you listen to a good choir singing and then the preacher gets up in the doorrooms and you haven't got anything to leave with uh, so you eat the preacher alive on the way home. You say, hey, wife, I don't think that was very good this morning. I don't think he studied that. I actually think he might have even been wrong about that point. I didn't even get a point or, <clears throat> or whatever. You know, the preacher's going to be, he's going to be uh, the uh, pre-meal uh, thing before you get to the restaurant to eat. <clears throat> he's going to be ate alive. Whatever he said, preach, does, uh, the way he walked, if he went like this, and he wasn't supposed to, and uh, uh, he, uh, he's always doing this or uh, 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 this uh, or something. And say, man, you know that man scratches all the time. He must never take a bath. And, and, you know, you can do all kinds of things to make weakness because we're men, we are weak beings. And we have to practice uh, breaking all the habits that would cause us to not be able to perform like we need to and I bet you some people bet on the way home, said, <laughs> we bet on the way to church today that he'd pick his nose one time, and he did. I win. Give him my dollar. And so, uh, you know, preachers are, are a, a, they're a product of conversation. And they're going to be a product of conversation. If you see him run a yellow light, nearly red, downtown, He's going to hear about it Sunday. You're going to say, hey, preacher, I saw you. Yeah, man, you like to run that red light, boy. You like to got nailed. And uh, so, weakness of men. We are weak people. But that doesn't make us evil people. So we need to be careful we don't be perceived as evil or, or by men's tradition. We ought to live by God's tradition, not by men's tradition. Say, well, that's okay. He does it. Well, a guy runs around on his wife. Is it okay for you to run around your wife? No, it ain't. And so, just because somebody else does something, you can't do it. And you've got to do it right. And, and so, the instructiveness of Bible literature. What is Bible uh, literature? It's something that you can lecture on. And it involves an analysis when you're going to lecture on it. Analysis of that literature. And uh, it's called a trepidation and illustration. A trepidation, that's a word I can't explain to you what it is. I know what it is, and I know that it's uh, like a lion in a cage. And you have uh, brought this subject that you were uh, studying into captivity. And as you brought it into captivity, and you put it out, and you say it now, and you put it out. I'm going over lessons that I did. This is school lessons that I've already done, <coughs> done a year or two ago. I'm rehearsing these lessons. I'm going back through, and I'm looking at I, what I wrote. Godly living, grace is God's goodness. The grace of God has brought us to a place 
where we can live godly if we've studied and met the criteria that we need to meet to be in the place that God wants us. The unique, uniqueness of Christian living can bring you to a uniqueness in a sermon and it can be seen in the message. Now, you are full life. You're, you are the living witness of your ministry. No matter what you are. If you're a jailhouse preacher, you need to live above jailhouse ethics. If you're a church house preacher, you need to live up to church house ethics. You always need to be on guard of seeking, uh, the devil is seeking out whom he may devour. Do you think he's only interested in those that are his? Absolutely not. He is double interested in those who are not his, who are in the word of God, who in that word is their aim to live godly and to live in the method which adapts itself to the culture, the sentiment, the, the, the uh, uh, sympathies, and the situation of the people who live in the Spirit and deliver a message from God. You have to live that way if you're going to deliver a message from God. You've got to be living in that manner. Uh, and we're going to face, meet face to face with people that see our actions, that see our life, that read our life. They don't read just what we say. I, I love it when people say, hey, he lives what he says. I, I like that. If, if you see a preacher that lives what he says, that lives what he preaches, a sermon should be Bible-centered, life-centered, heart-centered, and also scholarly and uh, legally Biblically, uh, logical, and legally done as far as the Word goes, the way God says it ought to be. And that's what we need to do. If we're going to put sermons together, the effectiveness of that sermon is going to be according to the hours we put in that message. Uh, the preacher I sit under right now is a very, very scholarly man. I love the fact he knows how to use his computer. I cannot access my computer and use it because I cannot spell. If I cannot spell, I cannot ask my computer what I want to look up and what I want to see and what I would like to review. I cannot ask it unless I could talk to it. And I understand you could do that, but I'd have to be more scholarly in the computer area to be able to do that, and I'm not. And so therefore, I have to dig out and in order to have sermon effectiveness, I have to follow the recipe that I get from my, my little King James Version Bible I was talking. I preached a message out of it just a little while ago that was an hour long. And I used this, this Oxford King James Version right here. And uh, it's a Schofield uh, Bible, and I love it. A Schofield has a set of series of... Uh, notes and helps that you can find in, in, in there. Let's just open anywhere right here. Uh, verse 43 of 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. And it said, And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that thou should comest with staves? Well, I just opened that up to that. But I'm familiar with the Bible. This is Goliath talking. And they sent little old David out there. And Goliath says, Am I a dog that you send him out there to me? And the Philistines uh, cursed David by his gods. Now the Philistine had gods that were not the god of this Bible. And they cursed David in the language of those gods. And look, this is it right here. You get one of these. You get a Schofield and uh, King James Version, and you can use the footnotes. You can build messages. Our time's about coming and gone. This Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word, and we've been talking about homiletics today, and we will uh, sign off in a minute here and see you next time. Uh, be sure and pass on the information of where you found these messages and to people who would like to study and would like to learn more 
about the Lord God of heaven, the way of salvation, the way to live as a Christian would live. We have it here. See you next time. Bye-bye.